With the increased interest in overlanding and off-roading in the past year has come increased demand for used vehicles, inflating prices of vehicles like our third-gen 4Runner to the point they've even landed on Daddy Doug's radar. This red-hot off-road market isn't showing any signs of letting down. In fact, in the past year, we've seen major OEMs further expand their lineup of new adventure gaming rigs. That's all fine and dandy until you take a look at the price. There's no reason someone should have to finance $50,000 worth of brand new vehicle to go out and start exploring. Fret not, there are still plenty of capable vehicles out there for cheap, you just gotta know which ones to look at. We touched on this subject a few months back in another video, and since then a lot of you have chimed in with a laundry list of vehicles we didn't mention the first time. Well, we heard you, and today we're going to be giving you a list of five incredible off-road and overland vehicles that you can buy right now for between $5,000 and $7,500, many of them further less than that. I'll even show you the cheapest body-on-frame four-wheel drive Toyota you can buy right now, which is still a lot more affordable than you might think. Now, before I get into this list, Let's just be clear here, there are some risks associated with buying a used car and especially one at this price point. So I suggest you follow up with your own research before you buy any of the vehicles on this list. Also, it's always a good idea to have a qualified independent mechanic look over a vehicle before you hand over the cash. I know you're probably going to tell me that there's another Nissan, or as we like to call them here in America, Nissan from this era that might actually be a better off-roader, the Xterra. No, I didn't skip the Xterra for its looks. While it might be the ugly duckling of the off-roading world, the first gen Xterra is a very cost-effective and capable off-roader. And that's part of the reason why I'd prefer the R50. As someone who graduated high school in the year 2000, I can still remember the successful lifestyle marketing campaign Nissan was running around the Xterra, showing Xterra owners whitewater boogie boarding and jumping out of helicopters on skateboards. And because they were a little cheaper than that era's forerunner, the extreme sports generation snapped them right up and immediately went out and pummeled the living hell out of them, or at least a significant number of them. Oh, oh, sh oh, Holy oh, sh oh, oh, oh my god! This means that most of the first gen Xterras you'll encounter now have lived some colorful lives and will likely have the scars to show for it, not to mention the faded plastics. Some things get better with age. Early 2000s automotive plastic cladding isn't one of them. At the same time, Nissan had another rig in the stable which shares a lot of the Xterra's capability but was done up in a more refined package and in many ways represented a bridge between the 20th and 21st centuries for Nissan, the R50 Pathfinder. Where the Xterra was a brash body-on-frame design, the R50 Pathfinder featured a unibody structure that lent itself to some better comfort, on-road manners, and three times the torsional rigidity of its body-on-frame predecessor. This refinement also made itself felt, or less felt, through a five-link rear coil spring suspension over live axle, just like the third gen 4Runner. The Xterra never got coils in either generation. When the R50 started its life, it was powered by the VG33E engine, one of the last of Nissan's long line of VG V6 engines, powering sedans, multiple generations of the 300ZX, and Nissan's pickups and SUVs. Essentially, it was to Nissan what the venerable small block Chevy was to General Motors. Just like General Motors began replacing the small block with the LS around the turn of the millennium, Nissan began replacing the VG with the new VQ. While the Xterra had to wait until its second generation to get the VQ, the R50 Pathfinder got it halfway through its run, boosting horsepower numbers by almost 50% all the way to a respectable 250. Yes, there were diesel variants and I'm probably sure they were either splendid or trash, but I wouldn't know since like almost all the diesel variations of awesome vehicles sold internationally, we never got them here in America. It's essentially a very capable out of the box off-roader with very pleasant road manners and capabilities, but is significantly undervalued and underutilized at the moment. If I was buying, I'd look for one with the older VG motors with a manual transmission for its rugged simplicity. Unless you just really gotta haul ass down the highway or tow something, then I'd go with the later VQ powered models. Both can be had with relatively low miles for under $5,000. Honestly, I'm surprised CC hasn't pushed me to buy one because like the old man in Nissan's Enjoy the Ride commercial said, dogs love trucks.
What do the Isuzu Trooper, Isuzu Rodeo Bighorn, Holden Jockaroo, Sang Young Corando Family, Subaru Bighorn, Isuzu Caribe 442, Isuzu Citation, Acura SLA, Holden Monterey, HSV Jockaroo, Opal Monterey, and the Sanju 9 Trooper have in common? Well, they're all the same awesome four-wheel drive vehicle. Those of you of our audience who are under 30 might not be all that familiar with the Suzu considering they completely withdrew their consumer vehicle presence from these shores in 2007. That being said, they're still involved in the heavy duty pickup truck and diesel segment here in the United States through a joint venture called D-Max. If that name kind of sounds familiar to you, it's because that particular collaboration has been very prosperous, producing the highly successful Duramax line of engine featured in GM trucks. But long before the Dirty Max, Isuzu was making cars, compact pickups, and SUVs. Much like today's social media darlings are discovering that one of the most powerful ways to grow their brand is through collaborations, Isuzu was collabing all over the place. When Chevy needed a compact pickup to add to their lineup in the 70s, Isuzu offered some love in the form of their compact pickup, which was then rebranded and sold in the US as the Chevy Love. This spirit of collaboration only intensified as time went by. Isuzu first rolled out the Trooper in 1981 as a basic yet capable off-road machine powered by a four-cylinder motor with a four-speed manual and part-time four-wheel drive. This first generation eventually evolved to include a multitude of power plants, including V6s and turbo diesel motors and automatic transmissions. Unlike almost every other internationally sold vehicle we've ever talked about, we actually did manage to get the diesel version here in the United States, albeit for one brief shining moment that was the 1986 model year. In 1992, the second and final generation of Trooper was launched, which stayed on sale until 2002. The four-cylinder gas motors were eliminated and the Trooper was only offered in gas V6 options here in the United States and, of course, turbo diesel models were available and popular overseas, much to my chagrin. It's definitely a tough choice for me between the two generations, but only because my 80s nostalgia gets the best of me every time I see a first generation trooper. I remember back to my elementary school days when my yuppie neighbors had the coolest stable in town, a blue four-door Isuzu trooper and an Isuzu Impulse Coupe with that glorious louvered rear window. Alas, as much fun as a project first gen trooper would be, and there still are quite a few of them out there for cheap, they're all now at least 30 years old and are going to show their age in ways that might need a little more TLC than most people are willing or able to put in. For that reason, if I were in the market, I'd look for a second generation, preferably a 1995 to 97 model. From what the forums tell me, these are the best years for capability, features, and reliability in the second generation. While the Trooper doesn't have a huge following here in the United States, it does have a more robust international aftermarket you can lean on. From what I gather, the Holden Jockaroo variant was pretty successful in Australia, so you can still find all the accessories you need through vendors like ARB. Okay, yeah, I just put the Commander on the list, but there have been more than a few people to chime in and say we should have included in our last list, and maybe they're right. I mean, hell, the world's most badass brother-in-law, AC Hank Schrader, drove one, so there's got to be something good about them, right? Honestly, I'd just kind of forgotten about the Commander. Yes, it's an aging Chrysler product from an era when Daimler was starting to sober up from the orgy of acquisition and excess that was the late 90s. Realizing the Chrysler they were sharing a bed with might not be the best long-term life partner and started considering their options. Yes, it does have its share of known reliability issues like exhaust manifolds on the Hemi V8s, leaky sunroofs, first year quality control issues, and the overall lack of refinement that was the hallmark of late stage Daimler Chrysler products which makes itself apparent in the cheap looking interior execution. And yes, it could have been so much more if Daimler would have stepped up to the plate and helped their partner out, but instead, Jeep was forced to engineer it off of their upcoming Grand Cherokee WK platform. Being that the final product was only two inches longer overall than its platform mate, yet included a third row seat, there were a lot of compromises that just didn't sit well with the target demographic like the abysmal second row legroom. They also never caught on en masse with the off-roading community, especially since the four-door JK Wrangler Unlimited, or as I like to refer to it, Adult Legos, was launched at this time and all the lifestyle off-roaders and mall crawlers bought that instead. Which was a shame because with multiple engine options from a paltry 210 horse V6 to a 5.7 liter 360 horse Hemi V8 and available quadra drive 2 four-wheel drive with electronic limited slip differentials, it's very capable. Also. 
because of its box-like shape and the fact that it carries that high roof line all the way through the vertically flat rear hatch, if you take out those third row seats, there is a ton of room in there to build out the overlanding setup of your dreams. Even though it's one of the least aftermarket supported Jeep products of the last 20 years, it's still a Jeep and there are still plenty of important upgrades available like lifts and whatnot. Were it me looking for one, I'd try to find a 2008 to 2009 4.7 liter with a quadra drive 2 four wheel drive system. Those were the years where the 4.7 got a huge boost in horsepower from 235 to 305. Many online forums will tell you that the first generation Ford Explorer is the go-to for cheap blue oval overlanders owing to its better geometry, form factor, and the fact that it could be had with the legendary Dana twin traction beam front axles, some even offered in 44 spec. They also had a sport two-door version that looked cool as hell and was also rebadged as the Navajo and sold by Mazda. Sadly. This burned out hulk of an Explorer, or Navajo, I can't really tell which, is the only two-door Explorer I've seen in years, and cleaner, low-mileage four-door first-gen Explorers are also getting harder to find. Then I remembered Ford started the trend of mid-size crew cab short box pickups that continues to this day with trucks like the Tacoma, Colorado, Frontier, and new Ford Ranger. In making the sport track, Ford lengthened out the Explorer's wheelbase by 10 inches, cut off the cab behind the passenger seat, and gave it a 50-inch cargo bed, which could be extended to almost 70 inches by deploying the tailgate and bed extender. It was sold in two generations. The first from 2000 to 2005 featured only a 4-liter V6, but was available in both a manual and automatic transmission. The second generation stepped it up a bit in 2007, gaining the option for a nearly 300 horse 4.6 liter 24 valve modular V8, the same one used in that era's F-150. This generation was also pioneering, for good or bad, as it joined the Honda Ridgeline and Hummer H1 to be only the third pickup truck ever to feature an independent rear suspension. Yeah, it doesn't have the best off-roading chops right out of the gate, but it's still plenty enough vehicle to take you most anywhere you really need to get. Plus, with what you save over contemporary mid-size pickups, you could easily throw some money at a lift, some bigger rubber, and even a limited slip or locking differential to help get you even further afield. Also, it's still a pickup, which means generic accessories like bed racks can be fitted to it, giving you an even better platform to build on. It's also a Ford, full of fairly common Ford parts that were found in some of the most common vehicles of the era it was produced, so it's not going to be hard to keep it on the road. I think the choice for me would be either a 2000 to 2005 four-wheel drive first gen with a manual transmission. Yes, the older V6 does have some issues like eating through timing chain guides, but it's definitely the cheapest way to get into a mid-size crew cab pickup at the moment and leaves quite a bit of cash on the table for improvements. First, if you already know you want the best value in a body-on-frame four-wheel drive and it has to be a Toyota, click off this video right now and go start looking for Sequoias. That is, until recently, these guys have been the insider secret when it comes to finding a four-wheel drive Toyota for cheap. Their undervaluation is so unwarranted it borders on criminal. Now, three or four years ago, I had to put the 4th Gen 4Runner in this spot because I like the somewhat smaller footprint for off-roading, yet it was the only 4Runner generation to ever offer a V8. Their status as a bargain has already been realized, and you'll be hard-pressed to find a decent example with less than 200,000 miles on the clock for under $8,000. Well, the 4th Gen 4Runner did get some play with the lifestyle crowd when it came out, the Sequoia was definitely the rig that the soccer moms bought, while the extreme crowd fell all over themselves at the side of the FJ Cruiser. So, the supply of the world's four-wheel drive Sequoias spent the most of their days ferrying children around suburbia, with the occasional camping trip down a well-groomed dirt road happening maybe once or twice a year. Which brings us to today, where the so-called Toyota tax is a real thing, fueled by outrageous demand and the near-mythical regard people hold for the brand. For some reason, though, the Yoda bros have largely overlooked the Sequoia. Sure, its stock geometry isn't exactly the best for off-road, but because it shares so much of its architecture with other Toyota trucks and SUVs from that era, there's a plethora of lift kits available. As more people have caught on to the Sequoia in the past few years, the aftermarket has also started to increase substantially and most of the leading producers of bumpers, racks, and the like do have some offerings for the first-gen Sequoia. But the real magic of the first-gen Sequoia is under the hood. It was powered by two different versions of one of the greatest V8 engine families ever produced, the Toyota 2UZ-FE. 
Remember a few years back when there was a lot of headlines about Toyota buying back a million mile 2007 Tundra that had its original engine? Guess what engine that was? The same 4.7 liter 2UZ with variable valve timing that came in 2005 to 2007 Sequoias. Now, it isn't all rose colored glasses with Toyotas, and while they do seldom fail and leave you stranded, that is, only if you follow the proper maintenance schedule and look out for some known issues. And while the 2UZ engine is built pretty damn well, there is one unforgivable design flaw, the starter location. They put the starter in the valley of the engine, right underneath the intake manifold, once again proving two points I've known for quite some time. One, that Toyotas, while being highly reliable, aren't always designed with ease of serviceability in mind, and two, engineers are the dumbest smart people I've ever met. Other than that, I wouldn't hesitate to buy one, and you shouldn't too. Now, I hope you enjoyed this list. Do you agree with this round of picks? Is there more that we forgot? Let us know in the comments section. If you're new here and you've enjoyed yourself, please consider subscribing and checking out what Secondhand Overland has to offer. As always, I'm Matt Kester. You can find me on Instagram at Frugal Explorer Dad. And while you're there, check out the channel at Secondhand Overland. Until next time, be good.